We want to welcome everybody here to the house of the Lord, and we welcome you on uh, Liberty Live tonight. We're so thankful you're tuning in and joining us, and uh, we're excited to be here once again in the house of the Lord. It's so good to see you, and uh, we're thankful for all that the, that the Lord has done for us. We're excited about being in the miracles of Jesus, and this one tonight really excites me as we look at it, just some things I'd never really uh, thought of that we find in this text, and so uh, it's, it's a very exciting uh, miracle to study tonight. But we want to pray. We realize those of you watching on Liberty Live that you've got needs and burdens, concerns. Uh, you, you've got requests. We want to pray for each of those. I, I got a call just a moment ago uh, in my office uh, for my cousin. Uh, they think she's had a stroke sometime in the last, in the recent past, and she, she wasn't aware of that. And uh, she's had uh, brain surgery, y'all prayed for her, and so forth uh, months, well, maybe a year or so or more ago. But but anyway, so I know there's many needs, many needs that are coming in. I know you've got needs in your own life. You've got burdens in your own life. So we want to pray for those. Uh, but uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer, remember each other, pray for our church, God's ministry here at Liberty, and uh, that we will be a lighthouse uh, in our Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and uttermost parts of the earth because we are surrounded by great need every day in the lives of people that surround us here uh, locally. Excuse me, locally. And also tonight, special request, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll read this on Sunday morning because I want everybody to be present when we read it. But we've got a message from uh, Vera in the Ukraine. I know she was just here back, I guess, in November, maybe, maybe it was December. Uh, but she's back there now in Ukraine, and uh, that, that situation is just uh, it, it's growing worse and worse for them and where they are at. But the text message uh, that I received, it's a true uh, testament as to the fact that they are living in a war zone and ministering in a war zone. Uh, and so we, we need to pray for the believers in Ukraine, our sister churches in Ukraine, uh, that God will just use them during such a dark time in their nation's uh, history. So uh, let's, let's pray for that. But let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for letting us come tonight. And Lord, thank you for giving us your word. And Father, I just want to pray that Lord, you would forgive us of our sins tonight. And Lord, that you'd cleanse us with the blood of Jesus. Use us in your service, Father, uh, as we as we come here tonight and as we leave, Lord, let us leave as, as servants of the Lord. And Father, we thank you for saving us, making us yours, giving us your promises. Father, we thank you for those watching on Liberty Live. I thank you for the brothers and sisters that are gathered here tonight. I pray for each one of them. I pray and want to ask you that, Father, you would just move in a mighty way among us. Be glorified, Lord, in all that's said and done. And help us, God, to just magnify Jesus. Uh, Lord, in our lives and in the life of liberty. Father, we want to pray uh, for the needs that, uh, Lord, people are, that they have, that they, the burdens they struggle with, the weight they carry. And God, we believe you're able to meet every need and lift every burden. God, I pray you'll do that. I pray for the lost, that you will convict them and show them, Father, that they've never been saved and that they need to be saved and born again before it is everlasting too late. And so, Father, we just uh, come to you tonight we cast ourselves upon you, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, if you will, take your Bibles tonight and turn with me to the book of Mark. The book of Mark. We're looking at another miracle of Jesus. I've lost track of the miracles uh, along the way, but uh, we are in the book of Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. Now, as you're turning there, Mark chapter 8, verse 22, uh, I do want to mention this fact because I always think it's significant. So remember the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And there are some of the miracles, uh, a few that the all four Gospel writers record. Uh, and then there's other miracles where only a couple of the gospel writers record the miracle. Maybe, say, maybe uh, John wasn't present for the, that particular miracle that's wrote about by Mark, uh, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, or, uh, you know, the, the Spirit moved 
John to write about something uh, that he and uh, Matthew had observed. So there's various reasons, but some miracles uh, are not recorded by all of the gospel writers. Uh, they're only recorded by two or three or, or maybe just one. And I think that's significant when one miracle is only mentioned by one writer. And that's what we find tonight. We find this miracle of this blind man that is healed only recorded by Mark. Uh, and that tells me there's something particular about this miracle that, that Mark noticed and that he observed. Uh, and the Holy Spirit used him to record uh, this miracle. And I've often said the, these gospel accounts, it's kind of like four of us going on a weekend fishing trip somewhere. Uh, and so if we come back from that fishing trip and someone asks us to write about our weekend, uh, well, there's going to be certain events that we all write about, uh, and then there'll be other things uh, that, that you know uh, our buddy may mention that we don't mention, something that caught his eye, uh, something in particular that struck him, and he records that whereas I wouldn't. And that's kind of the case here. Uh, but there's something about this miracle that only Mark records. And it's a very interesting miracle as we begin to look at it and we begin to think about uh, all that the Lord has done in this text. So let's look in Mark 8, uh, chapter, uh, chapter 8, Mark 8, verse 22. I want to read the text. This is the healing uh, of the blind man at, at uh, Bethsaida. And he cometh to Bethsaida, and they bring a blind man unto him, and besought him to touch him. That's their request. And he took the blind man by the hand, led him out of the town, and when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw aught, if he saw anything. And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. After that, he put his hand again upon his eyes, and he made him look up, and he was restored and saw every man clearly, and he sent him away to his house, saying, Neither go into town nor tell it uh, to any in the town. Now, let me say a, a, a few things about this text as we work our way through it. So here's the story in, in modern English. Uh, some friends bring a blind man to Jesus, and they say, Lord, will you touch him and heal him? That was their request. The Bible says the Lord takes the man's hand, leads him out of the city, gets away alone somewhere, and that the Lord spits in his eyes and then touches the man and asks him, can you see? And the man says, well, I see men, but they look like trees walking around. So a blurry picture, if you will. Uh, and then the Bible says the Lord touches the man's eyes again, and then he says, now can you see? Uh, and the man says, yeah, I see men clearly as they are. Uh, and then, of course, the Lord commands him, you know, don't go back into the city and tell, and, and tell anyone what has taken place uh, or what has, bu has been done. Don't tell it to, to any in the town. So that's the story. But let's look for just a few minutes at this miracle because there's some important truths. To begin with, I do want, to know, I do want you to notice this. I want you to notice uh, that some friends, once again, we find this in Scripture over and over. Once again, we find some friends bring a friend in need to Jesus. Now that is something we, that is a reoccurring truth that we find in Scripture. Not only a reoccurring theme, but it is a reoccurring truth that that is how people get to Jesus because a friend who knows the Lord brings them to the Lord. Now, it may simply be by prayer. It may be because you've carried someone to prayer. In fact, I've often said that we are all here tonight uh, because somebody prayed for us. Uh, and the truth of the matter is uh, that we may not even know all of the people who did pray for us. To bring, it may surprise you to learn one day in heaven who really prayed for you uh, to bring you into a relationship with Jesus Christ uh, and who has prayed for you in your lifetime uh, so that God has kept you in His grace and kept you through troubles and trials and storms. Uh, but nevertheless, the truth is this, that it was, a, it was friends who brought this man to Jesus because they cared enough about Him, they trusted and believed enough in the power of the Lord and of His healing might to where they joined together and said, hey, we've got to get our friend to Jesus. Let's take him to the Lord. 
And so uh, that's the way it worked. Now, I can take this a step further, and we can talk about soul winning, if you will, uh, because uh, lost people need Jesus. And somewhere in the life of that lost person, there's someone that's saved and been born again uh, that God has put into their life along life's way. And, uh, and one of the things about leading people to the Lord that, that, mu- that you must have is you must have some kind of relational... I want to be careful saying must because uh, we don't want to discount the work of the Spirit. But there, there usually has to be some kind of a relational connection there, a relational tie, uh, so that you can lead people to the Lord. That's why somebody will call me and say, Hey, preacher, well, I need you to come because... Uh, uh, my, my great cousin, uh, Bill, he's lost and he needs to be saved. Uh, and will you go see him? And I'll gladly go see him. But the thing is, he doesn't know me. And people has, have got to know that they, tr- that they can trust you and there's got to be a relationship already built there uh, before they'll listen to what you have to say. And I'll gladly go and I'll try my best, but probably what's going to happen is, is at most uh, we're just going to get to have an introduction and they're really not going to listen to what I say about Jesus. But because you already have a relationship with this individual, they already trust you, they already know you, they're going to listen to what you have to say. Uh, and they're going to give heed to the things that you speak because a lot of the time, if not most of the time, before somebody's going to listen to what you have to say, and it's true, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So there's got to be a relationship there with someone, and that's what we see these, these men here. They had a relationship, number one, with this man who had a need in their life. And they were able to say, hey, we've got to take him to Jesus. And they were able to say to him, come with us because we're going to take you to someone who can heal you. And the man trusted them enough. He had a relationship enough uh, to make their way to Jesus. Now, that's why we've got to remember when we leave this church and as we go out through the community through the day, and we, if, we keep the, if we keep a biblical mindset as we live our life, if we keep the mindset of, hey, my life is just not about the here and the now and what I, what I do in this world. At least you're still on there. Okay. And we keep this mindset that, hey, my life is not just about what's going on around me and what I do in this world. But my life, my very existence is of greater value than just the here and now. My life and my existence uh, is about the eternal. And so as I live my day, I've got to keep in mind, God has sent me here to be an ambassador. And as an ambassador, as a missionary on mission for Christ, I'm in the relationship building business. And so everywhere I go, everything I do, everything I say, I've got to remember God wants me to build relationships so that I'll have a bridge one day in which I can cross possibly and get to share Jesus with somebody that's in need. So keep that in mind as you think about it. Now, I do want to say something here about what happens next in this text. So we see Jesus takes this man by the hand, uh, and he leads this man away from the city. He leads this man away from the crowd and out to the countryside, most likely, uh, where he got this man alone where he could do this miracle. I want to tell you why he took the man out of the city. is because judgment had just previously been pronounced upon Bethsaida. Because the Lord had worked some miracles there. The feeding of the 5,000 was one of them. The Lord had done some great things in, in their midst and among them so they could see uh, that, that their faith needed to be in Jesus the Christ. But Now follow with me. But they denied Him and they denied Him and they denied Him and they refused to trust Him and follow Him even though He had worked all of these great miracles. And because of their unbelief, judgment had now been pronounced upon that entire city. That doesn't mean that God still wasn't going to work miracles in the life of individuals. That's just like America. I believe judgment has been pronounced upon America. There's no doubt about that. America is under the judgment of God. That that is as solid as the Bible you hold in your hand. But God is still going to bless individuals that love Him and are sold out to Him. He's going to use them. He's going to bless churches, the churches that are still adhering to the Word of God and standing on the Word of God. And so God's still going to save individuals. 
and he's still going to heal individuals as in this miracle we're looking at. Uh, but he was going to do it outside the city because another miracle wouldn't have changed their mind. And, and so judgment had been pronounced because of their unbelief. And let me say something, how this, uh, how this truth transcends what we see in God's Word. And I want you to listen if you're watching on Liberty Live. And I want you to listen if you're watching this six months from this recording or six years from this recording. I want you to know that to turn away the convicting power of God's Spirit is a very dangerous thing to turn away from trusting in Christ and putting your faith in Him. Uh, when the gospel has been preached, and this is, this is the Word of God, when the Word of God has been preached and truth has been shared with you, and you turn away the gospel of Jesus, it is a very, very dangerous thing. And it's dangerous because you're only going to turn away from it for so long. Because God's only going to give you so many chances. I don't, I, listen, and I don't know how many chances that are. That is. Uh, I do know the Bible says that He's long suffering uh, and that He's patient and that He's willing that none should perish but all should come to repentance. And what I do know is that God will move heaven upon this earth to bring one sinner into a relationship with Him. That's how kind, and that's how good, and that's how merciful, and that's how gracious our God in heaven is. In fact, if we could really share our testimony, I mean, and we can't do that, because you, 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 know, you only tell part of your testimony. Because if you told your whole testimony, then they would throw you out of Carnesville or Franklin County. If everybody really knew you, if everybody really knew me, you don't have to say amen right there. I'm not looking for amens tonight. Uh, but So that's just the truth of the matter. But if we could show our whole testimony and write our whole testimony down, it would be evidence tonight of how far God will reach down to lift a sinner into a relationship with Him. Because there's evidence here tonight of how, God, how far God will do that. And so it is a very, very, but with all that being said of God's grace and God's mercy and His kindness and, His, and, and how loving He is. And I believe He's greater in love and mercy and grace than we could ever preach. If we preached for a week on the mercy of God, we would barely touch the barrel. Uh, it would just be a drop in an ocean compared to the mercy that God truly has. I don't think we can understand it. But with all of that said, what I do know from the Word of God is, is that also it's a very dangerous thing to keep turning from Him. When the Word of God is preached and you've been given an offer of salvation, somebody's witness to you over and over and you don't, you don't yield your life to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, it is a very dangerous, dangerous thing. I'm just going to leave that there because that's not the sermon tonight. But that's what happened to Bethsaida. The Word of God had been presented, so to speak. The power of God had been shown, and they discontinued in unbelief. And finally, judgment had been pronounced against them to where they could no longer be saved. But let me move on because I do want to show you a few things. Now, so what I want you to see next is this, is that this man, he was not born blind because the Lord asked him after he spit in his eyes, and he touched him. He said, what do you see? And the man said, well, I see men, but they look as trees. Well, if you've been born blind, you don't know what a tree looks like. You've got to think about this. If you've been born blind, you don't know what a man looks like. If you've been born blind, a dog could come by, and you might think that's a man if you suddenly received your sight. Uh, and so this man had not been born blind, but something had happened to him in his lifetime, whether in an accident or a disease, that had left this man blind. Because he had obviously seen before. He knew what men looked like. He knew what trees looked like. And he was trying to get his vision focused to where he could, uh, where he could begin to see uh, men clearly as Jesus worked this miracle. Uh, and, and so uh, something had happened in his lifetime that caused him to need a miracle in his life. And boy, listen, that is really the way it is with us, isn't it? You know, something happens in our childhood. Something happens in our teenage years or our 20s. Or maybe something happens after we've got life settled and we're, we think life's moving on and, 
and we're in the dreams coming true, the, the, the American dreams coming true in our life, and something happens, and it kind of changes the course of our life. I met a man. <clears throat> I met a man one time, um, and this man he was on his way to prison, and, and he began to tell me his story. And his story went all the way back to when he was a child. He was in his early teens. And something so bad had happened to that man in his early teens that it led him immediately on a road that was a very, very troubled road. And it eventually led him to prison. So things happen in our lives. Things happen in our lives along the way. And that brings us to a place where being a believer, look, I know I'm saved. I know I'm going to heaven. You know, I know God's good to me and God's blessing me and God's blessed me, but something still happened along the way while I was traveling life's road. And, and it's crippled you. It's crippled you because what happens is without going psychosocial on you and talking about Dr. Phil type stuff, uh, what's happened is, is it still affects you today. Yeah, you're blessed, you're saved, you know you're on your way to heaven. God's good to you. Yes, you'll acknowledge all that, but also you're crippled still because you have this thing from your yesterdays. So this man once saw, but something happened in his life that gave him this disability. But listen, I do believe the Bible when it says, by his stripes we are healed. And I believe the Bible where the Bible over and over talks about the healing of individuals. And the Bible doesn't just say, well, God fixed their leg, or, or Jesus fixed their leg, or Jesus fixed their withered arm, or, or, or Jesus fixed the issue of blood. But the Bible over and over says, but the Lord made that person whole. Referring to inner healing and outer healing. So I do believe that by his stripes we are healed, and I believe that healing comes in many forms. And I believe there's not a disability that you can, can bring to him that he, he can't heal and make whole. And I'm speaking about the things in life that, that break us and trouble us on the inside. So, so there's that. But I, I want let's look at the miracle, and I close with these really last two things. Now watch. So the... the the friends bring this man to Jesus, and here's what they say. They said, Lord, um, if you will, touch him. Okay, now watch. Very specific. Lord, if you will, touch him. And so the Lord says, okay, so he gets him by the hand, takes him out of the city because he's getting him away from all the unbelievers uh, and the unbelief and the curse that's on this on uh, Bethsaida. And he takes him over there. He says, stand in front of me. Stand real still just for a minute. And he spits in his eyes. Now, I don't know what you're smiling at. I don't know how Jesus spit, but I'm just, you know, I'm kind of adding to the Scripture. But some way or another, he spit. Now, that's, that's not what the friends asked. They, they didn't say, Lord, our friend's blind. Will you please spit in his face and spit in his eyes? No. No, they said, Lord, will you just touch him? But the Lord takes him over there and he, he spits in his eyes. And then he touches him. says, can you see? And the man says, no, I, I, see, uh, I see men, but they look like trees. It's blurry. looks like trees walking around. And then the Lord touches him again. He says, now can you see? And the man says, yeah, I can, now, I can now see. So my thought is this, the Lord give me, is that when we're thinking about miracles in our lives, because there's been things happen to cripple us, there's healing that needs to take place inside of our lives, inside of our hearts, inside of our minds. And we ask the Lord, Lord, I need you to do this. Or Lord, I need you to do that. Lord, if you'll only touch me here, if you'll only touch me there, I'll be made whole. This will fix me, Lord. And, and so what I'm saying is, is we kind of write out the prescription. Or let me say, we write out the orders. And we give it, to Dr. Jesus, and we say, here's the orders. If you'll follow the orders in detail, then I can be fixed and made whole. But what I want you to see in this miracle here is this, is that, listen, 
God's got many ways in which he brings healing to us. Do you understand that? He's got many different ways. It may not be the way we thought. And it may not be the way we think that it needs to be given to us. The friends say, Lord, touch our blind friend. Touch him and we know he'll be healed. And the Lord says, and spits in his eyes. I would imagine that's probably the place where they have a committee meeting right there. You know, the Baptist church got to have a committee meeting over every little thing. Well, boys, come to us together just a minute. I don't know what the Lord's doing, but if you notice, we did not ask him to spit in my friend's face, but we asked him to touch our friend, and he's not doing what we ask. He spit. Maybe we should uh, vote him out or ask him to leave, and maybe we should tell him not to come back. I don't know what they did, but I know that Jesus didn't do the way they asked. But keep in mind this, God knew their heart. The Lord knew their heart. The Lord had every intention on healing this friend because these friends had brought their friend in faith. So the Lord was going to heal them, but what we learn here is this, is that the Lord doesn't always do things the way we ask. Even when we need help and we need miracles, it sometimes comes in unexpected ways and it comes in unexpected avenues. And then what we see and we learn from this miracle is this. So the lesson, let me back up. So the lesson from that is, is if you need that miracle, because we be, we're here tonight because we believe God still works miracles. If you need that miracle, don't be disappointed when you ask the Lord to do this to work out that miracle or to do that to work out that miracle and the Lord doesn't do it like you ask. We might be better off just to say, Lord, you know I need a miracle. So I'm going to trust you with how you bring it because I believe you are a God who works miracles today. So Lord, I'm just going to leave it into your hands. The avenue you choose, the path you lay out to make this thing happen, the resources you pull together, the provisions you send, you choose to send or not send. Lord, I'm just leaving it all up to you. And I'm just submitting myself as a humble servant in need of a miracle in my life. And we let God choose the path. But one thing we also learn next that happens, the very next thing is this. This is one of the only miracles, and this is maybe why it's in Mark. The only miracles that does miracle that doesn't happen instantaneously. Like, yeah, there's the blind men, they have to go wash, and as they go washing, they, they receive the healing. But this miracle here, it's gradual, and it's as if it is in stages. And so miracles happen, but we need not expect just a lightning bolt fall from the sky or the waters to part on Lake Hartwell, and we can walk across on dry ground, whatever the case may be. Uh, but it could be possible that God's working and he's already worked. And it's just a gradual miracle. He spit in this man's eyes. wasn't what they asked for. It wasn't how they thought it was going to come. In fact, it probably bewildered them and they probably started questioning the Lord. But he spits in this man's eyes, puts his hands on his eyes, and he says, now what do you see? And the man says, well, I don't, you know, I, I see men, but they look like trees. Everything's still blurry. And, and then the Lord says, come here. He touches him a second time, the second touch. And that time he says, what do you see? And he says, I see men clearly as they are. So don't be disheartened when you pray and you pray and you ask God for a miracle. And you've just not received that miracle yet and you just don't understand it or things are not happening in the way we want them to happen or here's the big one for you and I, in the time that we want them to happen in. Because when we write the order for God to write, work a miracle for us, we often tell them how it needs to be done, and then we certainly almost always tell them, and Lord, it's got to be done by this time. Like, I need it now. But the Lord worked this miracle in his own time, and he certainly did it in his own way, spit in the man's eyes, put his hand on him, and then put his hand on him again, and then... 
the miracle gradually unfolded. So I'll tell you what we need today. Harold Wilmington said this about this text. He said, what we need as believers today, he said, we all need that second touch that's in this text right here. We all need that second touch. And that second touch is what let that man see clearly. And that's exactly what we need today. We need that second touch so that we can see clearly. I'll tell you this. The way the devil is on the move today because he knows his time is short. He knows things are about to wrap up. Listen, he knows the Bible better than we know the Bible. and He knows prophecy better than we know prophecy. And you may turn on the news and you may see a headline and just think it's another headline, another bad event in the world, but the devil lines it up with Scripture and, and prophecy. And He knows. He knows his time is near. So he's unleashed all of hell. And I'll tell you this, if you're going to be a believer today and if you're going to be a believer, part of a Bible-believing church in this day in which we live, you better ask the Lord to let you see clearly so that you be not deceived. You remember that Jesus... His disciples come to him wanting to know Matthew 24 about the last days. Basically, that was their question. Lord, we want to know about the last days. Teach us about prophecy. Tell us when all of these things are going to be that you're talking about. One stone left not upon another concerning the temple and all of that. Do you remember instead of Jesus saying, well, sit down, I'm going to give you a prophecy lesson. I'm going to give you some prophetic truths that I received in a dream that I drew pictures of and I have wrote books about. That's what those guys on TV say, you know. Now, Jesus didn't say all that. Jesus said, okay, you want to know about the last days? I'm going to tell you about the last days. Number one, be not deceived. That's what Jesus said. So what we need is like exactly what this man received. We need that second touch so we're not deceived in these last days. I'm going to tell you something. There's some of the craziest stuff going on in the church world right now you've ever seen. The craziest stuff. I'm, and I'm talking about Bible-believing churches. I'm not talking about these nut job churches, these crackerjack box churches. I'm talking about Bible-believing churches, crazy stuff taking place and going on because people's being led and they're being deceived. And it ain't the Lord that's misleading them or deceiving them, but it's the wicked one because he's working. He's working. So we need that second touch. So God's got a miracle in store for somebody here tonight. God's got a miracle in store for somebody watching on Liberty Live. I believe that with everything that is within me. And I believe from the truths of this text, there's a miracle waiting for you. But we just got to take the things we've learned from this text. And right, right at the close of it, it's that. Is that we don't, ask, we don't ask or tell how God needs to do it. But we just simply bring ourselves as a servant of the Most High God. Say, Lord, you know I need a miracle. And if you don't do it, nobody else can. So thy will be done. Not my will, but thy will. And then realize, too, that sometimes miracles are not instantaneous. Sometimes lightning doesn't fall from the sky and God fixes everything. That sometimes miracles are gradual. And we've just got to be patient and willing and faithful, obedient servants until God brings that miracle to pass in our lives. And so I pray that you receive that miracle. And not only that, but when you receive it, I pray that you will leave and be a testimony, a living testimony as to the miracle and grace of God that's in your life. If you will stand... Tell somebody you love them tonight. And Liberty Live, thank you for joining us. We love each of you.